what health claims do these people make about vegetable oils? Okay, so I made a list of diseases. So everything that they claim that these vegetable oils either cause or worsen, I made a list, and then I just went through it systematically. It seems clear that vegetable oil consumption and cancer risk are inversely associated with one another. So the idea that vegetable oils cause cancer is kind of weird. <laughs> We've tested whether or not vegetable oils increase or decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease. And what comes out is that, if anything, vegetable oils reduce the risk of heart disease. Nick Hebert, the Nutrivore, he's one of the sharpest minds in nutrition. He's known for his debates. He's also written a number of very interesting articles on seeds, oils, quack smashing, ancestral eating, whether or not that's true. So Nick, is there anything I missed out in my introduction? No, that sounds fine. I mean, that's a pretty good encapsulation of what I typically do online is just general nutrition science communication through sarcasm and belligerence. <laughs> <laughs> you are a self learner. So you were studying and then you dropped out for financial reasons and yep. then eventually a few years down the line you were having some problems with the keto diet and then you started yeah. getting into nutrition yeah so i originally went to the university of manitoba i took human nutritional sciences and linguistics um back in 2009 2010 and unfortunately i had to drop out due to financial reasons not really anything that i could have helped at the time it was some kind of clerical error um, on the provincial government's part that led me to have to drop out. Uh, it was really unfortunate. I don't think anybody's particularly like to blame for it. But yeah, I've always had an interest in nutrition since I got out of high school. When I got out of high school, I was like really overweight and I was like, okay, how do I fix this? And, you know, I, I didn't really like find a diet to like follow to like kind of fix that problem. I just like tried to picture like what a quintessential healthy diet based on my conceptions back then would be like so i basically just ate nothing but like tofu and broccoli for like a year and i lost like 100 pounds and ever since then i've had a fascination with nutrition but ever since i dropped out of university you know i i don't have like the formal education to fall back on anymore so i fell victim to a lot of uh quackery and a lot of very persuasive just so stories so i got on the keto bandwagon uh very quickly found out that that diet doesn't work for me very well <laughs> i kind of feel terrible on that diet like constantly so i was like huh well at least for me personally this doesn't seem like it's a very good diet so you know, I just started exploring more and more and more. And primarily, like, my education and nutrition came from just meeting a lot of really smart people in that domain and adjacent to that domain and getting my ass kicked in a lot of conversations. And instead of being hard-nosed about it and digging my heels in the sand, I just said, well, hey, what you're saying makes a lot of sense, and I'll adopt that view until I can find a better view. And, you know, just repeat that a couple hundred times, and here I am. You also have developed the Nutridex, evaluating different foods groups. Yeah, so like the Nutridex was something that was originally just kind of born out of necessity because back in 2019, I had lost my job. Um, I didn't get fired. I, I just straight up left because the manager was just being completely insufferable. Uh, what I had to do was figure out how to eat the most nutrient rich diet I could for the least amount of money. So what I did was I made a like a stratification of foods that I typically eat, and then made like a really kind of janky nutrient density score and then just divided each of those items by their price per 100 grams. And hey, you get like, the most amount of nutrition for the least amount of money. And then I found out on Reddit that there's a community of people who like really are into this kind of thing. It's called Eat Cheap and Healthy. I'm banned from that subreddit right now, but <laughs> <laughs> what I did was I put the uh, spreadsheet up on there and it exploded. It got like 4,000, 8,000 likes between the two posts that I made. So, I mean, people really seem to like it. But what was really valuable was everybody in the comments was just suggesting, well, why don't you do it this way? Why don't you do it that way? Why don't you add this? It'd be cool if it had this functionality as well, or it'd have a. It'd be cool if it had a score that would show some, uh, you know, 
show some other thing or represent some other thing. And basically the tool that I have now is just an aggregate of everybody's suggestions. Like there is barely even an original thought <laughs> in the actual tool itself. It's all just, hey, why don't you implement this? Yeah, why don't I implement that? And then I'd implement it and then it eventually became something that was good enough to sell and make money off of. That's currently available on your website. Yeah. So now I should describe exactly what it's turned into. It's turned into something that includes like dozens of different scores that are, they're all kind of tailored to different, like kind of dietary philosophies. Um, there's also like an anthropometrics calculator. You can calculate like your basal metabolic rates, your uh, energy expenditure. You can configure it for weight loss and stuff like that. It's kind of like, uh, it's not like a tracking tool, but it's really comprehensive now. And there are a lot of scores. They're actually a lot more, uh, there's a lot more information in there now than just nutrients. Like we, I actually got like a group of people together and did some interesting stuff to kind of figure out some of the scores. For example, we use genetic programming to figure out a satiety score or a satiety index based on some uh, satiety data from like 1995. This one researcher named Holt did like an entire study looking at the relative uh, satiety indices of many different foods compared to each other. And we use that data to create um, a calculation that would basically tell you how satiating of one food was likely to be versus another food. And that's also incorporated in the tool. So it's like a novel kind of calculation for satiety that's based on actual research data. Um, there's also data on oxalate and phytate if you're into that sort of thing. There's data on uh, price, shelf life, all sorts of stuff in there now. It's absolutely insane. Right. Let's focus on your most popular article, which is the comprehensive rebuttal to seed oil sophistry. When they were making my omelet, I saw the guy like pouring oil in a pan and I was like, oh, just curious, like what oil are you using? And he said canola oil. And I was like, now this is a result of fear mongering and misinformation like this. The biggest six fats fuel the inflammatory pathways. In the oils are horrible for humans. The process of making these oils, it really isn't pretty. You really don't want to ingest this stuff ever. It's disgusting. On the back, sunflower seed and or expeller pressed canola oil. These are the oils you want to avoid. These cause inflammation. You just get rid of all the corn, soy, canola, um, cottonseed oil. Just throw them away. Get rid of them. Don't even donate them. They just do not belong in your diet. Processed inflammatory oil. And on social media, we hear vegetable or seed oil is being blamed for everything, cardiovascular disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, autoimmune diseases, cognitive decline, inflammation. So your article went through all of these key health outcomes. How did you do it and what did you find? Yeah, so I just started off by making a list. Okay, what health claims do these people who are hand-waving about vegetable oils make like what kind of health claims are they making okay so i made a list of diseases so everything that they claim or at least the majority of things that they claim that these vegetable oils either cause or worsen i made a list and then i just went through it systematically and i when i say systematically i mean systematically I took um, graduate studies level courses on systematic review and meta-analysis so this is particularly um this, I mean, I was familiar with how to do this uh, ahead of time. And I just systematically scoured the literature, right? You do a systematic literature search, you pull research from different databases, you deduplicate it, you do abstract screening, then full text screening, and then you have like an aggregate of all of the data that's relevant to your research question. And I did this for all of them, every single endpoint in the article. Uh, so I basically ended up writing like a short, like a really short kind of meta analysis on every single one of these health outcomes. And honestly, at the end of the day, it's all, it just seems like hand waving. I wasn't able to find really that much evidence that, uh, that these vegetable oils are causing any sort of like problem, <laughs> not in and of themselves, right? You're not uniquely like that is to say, like if we replace all of the vegetable oils in our food supply with butter, I'm pretty sure we'd be in the same boat, right? So vegetable oils are the primary source of calories in junk food, and junk food is like a massive contributor to the obesity epidemic, but that's as far as the relationship goes. 
because I'm pretty sure if you did that that substitution that I just mentioned, I don't think it would have a meaningful impact on like the obesity epidemic. I think we'd be in the same boat. Uh, so I don't think there are any like uniquely deleterious effects of these oils. At least I wasn't able to find any like really high tier, um, like higher level, high internal validity evidence that it was the case. Uh, there are even some diseases that surprisingly seem to show an inverse association uh, with vegetable oil consumption, particularly cancer and type 2 diabetes. And there are, bio there are biologically plausible mechanisms, at least for the type 2 diabetes case. I'm not sure what to make of the cancer case, but it seems clear that vegetable oil consumption and cancer risk are inversely associated with one another. So the idea that vegetable oils cause cancer is kind of weird. <laughs> it's just kind of <laughs> strange. A lot of people, they get into mechanisms and they say these vegetable oils are unsaturated, so they're prone to oxidation. When you get this oxidation, that can lead to things such as atherosclerosis. In your article, you have two sections, one on lipoprotein oxidation, one on lipid peroxidation. What's the difference between these two and what did you find? Yeah, so... Um... Lipoprotein oxidation, like the oxidation of the actual lipoproteins themselves, is going to be a consequence more often than not of lipid peroxidation, either lipids within the lipoproteins themselves or out or, uh, you know, byproducts from lipid peroxidation outside of the lipoproteins, just modifying them in certain ways. Now, the difference uh, between, yeah, the, so the difference between like um, LDL oxidation or lipoprotein oxidation and just Per lipid peroxidation is just uh, one's downstream of the other. So, yeah, this was actually kind of interesting because a lot of people say, like, listen, these vegetable oils are causing heart disease because the vegetable oils oxidize. And LDL oxidation is part of the causal pathway in atherosclerosis. So clearly these vegetable oils must increase the risk of atherosclerosis. And it's not clear that that's actually the case. Uh, if you look at the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis, it's not clear at all that mo that that like lipoprotein oxidation itself would be a target for therapy. And so far, it has proven not to be a target for therapy because we have plenty of antioxidant studies where we can show that LDL oxidation is going down, but it's not really affecting risk. And we have. A really good study from 2006 actually looking at, hey, let's take the ox LDL in people's blood and actually see if there's a relationship with heart disease. And there was, but that relationship doesn't, it doesn't survive adjustment for ApoB. And ApoB is just another way of saying LDL particles at the end of the day. So it doesn't look like there's a uniquely deleterious effect of having more oxidized LDL. So my my goal with the first half of that section there's lipoprotein oxidation and then heart disease my goal with the first half of that section is just to say look like if you actually read the literature and you actually care about lipoprotein oxidation i'm not sure why you care about lipoprotein oxidation but if you do care about lipoprotein oxidation there are way bigger levers to pull like way bigger levers for example you could just eat a diet very rich in antioxidants and that has a larger effect on modulating the susceptibility of lipoproteins to oxidize than modulating or, or modifying the proportions of different kinds of fatty acids in your diet and modifying the degree of saturation of those fatty acids in your diet. Those effects are trivial compared to the effects of just like eating a lot of like eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, for example, and like antioxidants from eating a lot of fruits and vegetables and like beans and legumes and stuff. Like, that has a much larger effect. So anybody who wants to say, listen, we need to avoid the vegetable oils to get the LDL oxidation down as low as possible should be pretty strong advocates of diets that include, like, a lot of antioxidants because they have a much larger effect. And then the second half of that article, or not that article, with the section of the article on cardiovascular disease was just showing hey, listen, like these predictions just don't pan out when we actually test this. <laughs> like We've tested whether or not vegetable oils increase or decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease. And if anything, it looks like they decrease the risk precisely the way we suspect they should. Right. So, yeah, that was kind of it. It was I mean, with the second half of the article, it wasn't I wasn't really aiming 
to do anything necessarily. I was just aggregating the data and showing the data. Uh, I wasn't aiming to show anything. Like, if the data said that there was no association, that that would be what the data says. That's just not what the data says, right? With the lipoprotein oxidation stuff, I knew that it was, like, a really goofy thing to say. So, yeah, I, I just showed that it was a very goofy thing to say because I already knew ahead of time. But in the heart disease section, I was just basically saying, hey, man, uh, I'm going to scour the literature, and what comes out is what comes out, and what comes out is that... If anything, vegetable oils reduce the risk of heart disease. It's like, sorry, <laughs> the mechanisms aren't panning out in meat space. There's so many mechanisms and no one can actually <laughs> track everything which is going on. And so the most important is the health outcomes. The lag time of oxidation, if you compare to monounsaturated fatty acids, polyunsaturated and saturated fat. So the one that increases the lag time the most is monounsaturated fat and that's probably just because monounsaturated fat for whatever reason um replaces polyunsaturated fat in lipoproteins more readily than either than than saturated fat so if you have like a high polyunsaturated fat diet you're going to have lipoproteins that are very rich in polyunsaturated fat if you have a very um high saturated fat diet your for whatever reason your LDL particles the representation of polyunsaturated fats pretty immovable in that case it actually doesn't change too too much but then if you have a lot of monounsaturated fat it seems to displace the saturated fat and the polyunsaturated fat together and monounsaturated fat is pretty much just as resistant to oxidation as saturated fat so you're going to increase the lag time to LDL oxidation the most with monounsaturated fat just based on how this, the fatty acids are, the ease with which this, the fatty acids are being replaced in the actual lipoproteins themselves. One of the big claims on social media, which people are making is with regards to skin cancer. Do I worry about skin cancer? No. Should you worry about skin cancer? Yes. If you have seed oils in your diet. They say if you avoid seed oils, vegetable oils, it gives you protection against sunburn. Yeah, I've heard it, and it's absolutely hilarious. I don't know where this idea comes from. And, I mean, it just seems like a whole bunch of people running around, like, just screaming anecdotes into the ether. And I don't know why I should find those anecdotes persuasive. Because there's no control. Like, there's none of these things that these people harp on about. It's like, oh, we need control groups and randomized controlled trials to figure this out. And and then they seem completely comfortable just saying, listen, my anecdote supersedes the evidence hierarchy. And it's like, okay, I mean, you do you. But it, as it turns out, we actually have double-blind randomized controlled trial data on this particular research question, whether or not vegetable oils increase the risk of skin cancer. And it turns out that they, if anything, cut the risk of skin cancer in half. And it's statistically significant. Now, the funniest cope that I've heard when I brought this up to people who make these sorts of claims is that the vegetable oil group just became so intolerant to sunlight that they just never went outside. And that's why the risk went lower. And it's like, <laughs> okay, I mean, you're free to speculate, but until we have a good like justification for believing that that's likely the case, I think we're justified in believing that vegetable oils, if they do anything, reduces the risk of skin cancer. <laughs> yeah. In your debates, you mentioned terms such as p-value, whether a trial is sufficiently powered, so that people can understand your debates a little bit more. What do these terms mean? So if we start with power of a study. Yeah, the power of a study is basically... So in order to... You have to set up some assumptions, right? So how how many people do we need to study for what amount of time in order to detect a statistically significant effect if there is one to be seen and you can do this kind of a priori you can have prior knowledge but you run the calculation it'll basically tell you okay you need this ma this many people for this amount of time and if there is something to see you should be able to see it that's like the quick and dirty answer as to what power is so, for example, I can give a pertinent example right here. There was a study called the Minnesota Coronary Experiment. Um, it was like a famously underpowered study. They started off with like close to 900 people 
or or 9,000 people in total. And they were supposed to be running two groups, a vegetable oil group and a saturated fat group. But the study was done in mental hospitals. And in Minnesota at the time, there was a regional change in the policies around um, inst the institutionalization of certain people with certain mental illnesses. So there was like a mass exodus right when the trial started to the point where they only had under they had like under 2200 people by the time the trial actually concluded. They didn't actually get to do the full trial. Uh, they concluded, uh, I believe, after a few years, they were supposed to have a, the trial go on for a very long time. So their power calculation basically said that they needed at least 3,000 people for, I think it was 3.5 years or it could have been three years in order to detect a statistically significant effect between the groups if there was one to detect. And they ended up having about 2,100 people and they only followed them up for a median of 12 months. So they just did not have enough statistical power in order to actually detect a statistically significant effect. And lo and behold, the actual aggregated result that they found was a non-significant effect, right? So it's exactly what we would expect based on their inability to actually achieve power. So when I say power, that's basically the kind of idea that I'm trying to get across. For example, if they just change a small amount of saturated fat, the substitution mm. is very small. Is that related to power as well? Um, I think that would be more related to bias, but I think that could probably be related to power. I'm not a statistician. I would have to get back to you on that one. But I think it. I'm not entirely sure. I mean, it could be. Uh, mm. Yeah, I'd have to get back to you on that key values yeah so statistical significance another quick and dirty definition is it's a measure of compatibility with the null hypothesis so you have a null hypothesis you have an alternative hypothesis the p-value will tell you the degree of compatibility between the two and for statistical significance there's like an arbitrary cutoff usually it's just anything below 0 0.05 so you start at one right so completely null is one and then you just go down from there and anything that drops below 0 0.01 is just um, considered statistically significant. And what that means is that there's a relative, there, there is a sufficiently high amount of incompatibility with the null hypothesis that we can say that these results are less compatible with the null, are sufficiently incompatible with the null hypothesis such that we are uh, declaring that it's statistically significant. Uh, there's some other stuff related to like setting alphas and stuff that I don't really understand, but that's just basically the quick and dirty explanation for what uh, p values are representing there. Okay, good. What about Mendelian randomization? Yeah, Mendelian randomization is a really interesting type of epidemiological d uh, study design. Basically, what they're doing there is they're saying, listen, these genes that people have affect markers that are relevant to health outcomes. You know, like some people have genetically higher cholesterol. Some people have genetically higher blood glucose. Some people have genetically higher this, that, and the next thing, IGF-1. There's all sorts of different uh, correlates, biological correlates for disease risk that we have. And there are a whole bunch of genes that change these biological correlates. So basically, this study design is saying, if we are operating under the assumption that these genes are randomly distributed in the population, we can kind of design something that's like a natural RCT, right? We can have a group that doesn't have these genetic uh, variations and compare them to groups that do have the genetic variations. And because things like lifestyle and, you know, other sort of covariates and confounding factors are going to be randomized, that's the assumption, now, we can have relatively strong internal validity with this uh, type of epidemiological study design. And I actually think it's a really elegant study design. I would place that between prospective cohorts, cohort studies and randomized controlled trials. I'd place Mendelian randomization right between them because it's, it's kind of a mix of both. And there have been plenty of uh, studies that have been really informative that have come from that domain. For example, I think the data that really sealed the deal on LDL and cardiovascular disease probably came from the Mendelian randomization because, 
you know, when you're giving people a statin in an RCT, a statin might have a lot of side effects. It might, and by side effects, I don't mean like you feel bad when you take it. I mean, like it could uh, have a lot of unintended biological consequences. You're hitting more than just the target that you want to hit, right? These things have biological activity in a lot of different ways. So when you're lowering LDL, it, it seems very much like that would be the thing that's causing the effect, but maybe it isn't. Maybe there are pleiotropic effects of the drug. But in a Mendelian randomization sense, in just looking people with, looking at people with genetic variation that affects LDL, you don't really have that concern, right? Because you can look at a number of different genes that all modulate LDL, and if they all point in the same direction, that's very strong evidence that LDL has something to do with it. Because to say that this log linear association between LDL and heart disease, right, for example, to say that it's due to pleiotropy when you have like dozens of different genes affecting it and there's a log linear association across all of those different genes, I mean, that's just fantastical thinking. Like the chances of that being true are like one in one non nillion or something like that. It's just astronomical. So. I think the Mendelian randomization study design has been very informative for a few things in health science. Yeah. Pleiotropy. What does this mean? Yeah. So when something is pleiotropic, it just means that it's affecting multiple pathways simultaneously. You can check out Nick's full article on seed oils through his website, The Nutrivore. Seed oils are a type of vegetable oil, the general term that refers to edible oils from plants. Why are they demonized so much? First of all, this could be due to the appeal to nature fallacy where people believe that something that is processed cannot be good for us. Vegetable oils have connotations with being used as lubricants, for example, in engines. However, animal fats are also used in the manufacturing of soaps and lubricants. Animal fats have a wide range of industrial applications. Animal fats can also be used in diesel-fueled engines. Another reason could be due to the theoretical arachidonic acid pathway, which suggests that higher levels of omega-6 intake could lead to more inflammation within the body. We will shortly see a video by Gil Carvalho that this does not seem to pan out in reality. Food Science Bay on Instagram has suggested that this could be due to food elitism. For example, when spices first came to Europe, they were very highly demanded. But when the elite saw that it was very affordable for most people, they then stopped using these spices. When Europe's wealthiest families saw that the middle classes could afford to spice up their grub, they decided to move on with the aesthetic theory of taste that rather than using spices, food should taste like itself. The same could potentially be true for animal products that they are seen as a status symbol in our current society. We'll also see a video about food elitism. What is most important is looking at the health outcomes of vegetable oils. We have the studies. What's your view on canola oil? So my view is it's not a harmful oil. The carnivore crowd and the seed oil people try to make it sound like this is some horrific thing you are ingesting. And if you just watch the videos on how they process it and they go on and on and on, it's actually been tested. We have tons and tons of studies on this. And like I said earlier, there was a 31.9 year study with 39.1 years of follow-up in circulation. I'll be happy to send you that. It actually was cardioprotective. Obviously it depends on like what you're substituting out, but going from butter, for example, and especially margarine but even if you didn't people who ate canola oil by itself regardless of anything else was cardioprotective the balance of evidence seems very consistent as one review concluded despite the concern that omega-6 fatty acids increase inflammation current evidence from studies in humans does not support this view okay so if seed oils are not pro-inflammatory where does this idea come from i mean it's so pervasive it's all over the internet linoleic acid can be converted to another fat called arachidonic acid, which can then be converted into a number of molecules that can play an inflammatory role. So that's the basis for this idea. So it would make sense if the net effect of linoleic acid in living, breathing humans turned out to be pro-inflammatory. That would not be an unreasonable hypothesis. But what we do with hypotheses is we test them. We don't assume, because maybe in humans, it doesn't get converted for some reason. Or maybe it does, 
but it also does some other stuff that makes up for it. And it turns out that's exactly what happens. In humans, the production of arachidonic acid from linoleic acid is tightly regulated. So even wide variations in dietary linoleic acid do not materially alter the actual amount of arachidonic acid. In fact, decreasing dietary linoleic acid by up to 90%, so 10 times, was not significantly correlated with any changes in arachidonic acid levels. And increasing dietary linoleic acid up to six times more does not increase tissue arachidonic acid. So it doesn't get converted much in vivo in humans. As for the other possibility that it might do other things in parallel that might make up for it, that also pans out. These authors explain it. If one takes off the blinders, <laughs> these guys are brutal, and examines the entire arachidonic acid metabolome, so all the molecules that get produced from it, one finds a constellation of metabolites, so a bunch of different molecules. Some are pro-inflammatory, some are anti-inflammatory. The net impact on human metabolism is virtually impossible to predict. That's why we have to test things, not assume. So, to label the entire class of omega-6 metabolites as pro-inflammatory is painfully naive. So this is a lesson we've learned in many previous videos, and it's a crucial one. We don't make logical leaps from biochemical pathways or from isolated molecules to a net effect in living, breathing humans. We have to test it. And this goes for the heating questions as well. Seed oils are unstable. Seed oils have double bonds. What's the health effect in a human eating them? That's the bottom line. Okay, so maybe eating seed oils is not inflammatory for most people, but maybe some people have a particular susceptibility. It's like that for most things. Why would this be any different? So there are some genetic studies looking at people with different mutations in that pathway we just looked at that converts linoleic acid to arachidonic acid and beyond. So they put people on a diet high in linoleic acid, and people with one specific mutation, their CRP level trended to increase. So it's possible that there is a subset of people, maybe the more extreme cases, that have a special susceptibility. So if somebody has high inflammatory markers or has an inflammatory condition and they want to try moderating the seed oils, I don't see a problem. Also for people who just don't like them, or if you prefer uh, an omega-3 rich oil, like flaxseed oil, for example, or if you just heard so much stuff on the internet about seed oils that it stresses you out and you'd rather not, don't eat them. They're not essential. No oil is essential in the diet. Plenty of other healthy fat sources. And for those who do want to include some seed oils, who want to put some canola oil on their salad, who want to saute in some sunflower seed oil, inflammation is not a convincing reason not to do it not supported by the evidence, despite what people might repeat on social media. Seed oils have become such an emotionally charged topic that we're not even supposed to discuss this anymore. We're not supposed to share studies showing benefit. People complain you're promoting a toxic food. Promoting. Guys, this isn't sales. I don't make money from you buying seed oils or not. And if the science doesn't align with what we've heard before, the solution is not to stop showing the science and the emotional language promoting, vilifying, demonizing. This just distracts us from simply trying to figure things out. At the end of the day, we protect our health by calming down and basing our views on evidence, not stories. This stems from this. Elites are constantly working to differentiate themselves from the lower classes. In doing so, they often distinguish themselves by cultivating tastes, diets, and physical appearances that are in opposition to those of the subordinate groups. These social distinctions serve to naturalize and normalize social hierarchies. By the 1600s, though, the European market for spices had leveled out. They had become, generally speaking, widely affordable. Once spices became common, nobles decided they reflected middling tastes. To distinguish themselves from the baser appetites of the masses, the upper classes embraced new essentialism, demanding that food taste like itself. You don't let anyone give you shit, okay? Thanks a lot for tuning in. You can support Foolproof Mastery in a number of ways. First of all, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a review on Apple Podcasts with an honest opinion of what you think.
Leave plenty of comments on YouTube and share with your friends, family and colleagues if you feel that you have learned something new in order to keep on getting the knowledge out to as many people as possible. Finally, keep on living every day to the maximum and see you next time for another episode. Ciao.